I've, I've asked Sam and Ruth if, uh, if they would come and share with us some of their story of what it's like to say yes to Jesus in the harder seasons or the tougher moments or some of the things we have to navigate that we wouldn't write for ourselves, you know? And so, um, and, and, and I've just had the joy, along with so many others in this room as well, to be able to walk with these guys in the season that they're in. And, but, but they're going to come and share their story of saying yes to Jesus in some of the things that they're navigating right now. And so, would you welcome Ruth and Sam Buscom? Come on up, guys. All right, let's pray. Let's pray a blessing on them as they as they um, start off. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Sam and Ruth, and we ask now, Holy Spirit, all of the just the words and the thoughts and the meditations that have been on their heart as they've prepared to share here with us, that they would just flow freely and um, they would experience your presence and joy as they share their lives with us and they're following you, Jesus. And we ask it in your name, Lord. Amen. I love seeing Kathy Downs a little bit unhinged. <laughs> it's not often I get to see that. <laughs> We love you. We love you very much. Uh, Shall we start? Mm. Well, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction and then we'll do a bit of a tag team in teaching, but I'm just really thankful to be here. I'm really thankful to be in the room with all of you. I'm really thankful to have worshipped alongside you and cried out to God alongside you and thankful for the teaching and the stories that have happened Thus far, we had the privilege of uh, being in Victoria and and immersing ourselves in conference there and coming here and doing it all again has been such a privilege. So it's great to see you, uh, people who we've journeyed with for a really long time and some of you we haven't met yet. Um, We're just really feeling very blessed to be asked um, to share just a little bit of our story Um, So a bit of background, I landed at Yarra Valley Vineyard Church in early 2003 and was completely captured. I fell in love with the vineyard as a a 17-year-old. I found my home. And Sam came a few years later. Uh, Since we met, we have been serving the local church together in in different ways, on some level, uh, youth ministry, worship teams, that's just Uh, our story. Uh, We were close friends for about three years uh, and now we've been married for about 15. 15 and a few days, in fact. Yeah, two days ago. (laughs) We went to the fish markets to celebrate (laughs) and ate. The poor kids are just tagged along like, you are coming because this is our happy place. (laughs) So get over it. So we have four gorgeous and delightful children. I think there's a family photo somewhere in the slides. Um, Our eldest, Ben, is 13, Tom is 11, Mary is 9 and Jude is 6 and you'll see them around the place. They're loving being here too. Uh, You know, while we have loved serving local church and always believed very strongly that local church was God's very good idea and still is, Uh, We were honestly uh, just no people uh, when it came to church planting and very firm no people when it came to pastoring. But I'm very thankful that the Lord called us uh, into both these spaces. Uh, He did that gently and kindly, making it very clear to us that that was his plan for us, not ours. I'm thankful for his leading. So just over 10 years ago, uh, we said yes to Jesus and we said yes to Peter and Kathy uh, in joining them in planting uh, the Geelong Vineyard Church. Uh, And for the last five years, it's been our privilege to pastor the wonderful family there. Very precious to us. Uh, So here we are today. We're really just sharing our story very much in real time uh, as we walk through and have walked through um, some pretty significant challenges due to Sam's health, which he'll share a little bit about. 
So we wanted to just share with you a little of what the Lord is teaching us uh, and really leaning into what it means to give our yes to Jesus in the tough times. And our prayer is really that wherever you are at, whether you're in a season of ease, and we want to bless you. If you're in a season of ease, bless you, enjoy that. Or if you're in a season of challenge, that the Holy Spirit in this moment would stir you and spur you on to be able to give your yes to Jesus when times are tough. Let me hand on. Hello. <laughs> As you raise the mic up to your lips. Mm. Um, yeah, I just second everything that Ruthie's just set, shared with you and it's a real you know, blessing to go to both conferences and, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes you, you zone out when people are speaking. But then you go to the second conference and you pick up on those bits. <laughs> so I've got the full... Thanks. John Debbie, I've, I've got it all. <laughs> but I've, I loved how, you know, the invitation is always there for us from Jesus, isn't it? And it, and it happens on so many... Uh, spaces of our life um you know i've read something i think from john ortberg about just inviting that holy spirit every day where do you want to lead holy spirit and so that's that daily thing but then there's also the very intricacies of um you know saying yes to jesus in your finances or all those other spaces that are tough or in a a tough season you know when it's not going to plan you're like what's going on god what are you doing where are you And so, yeah, as Ruthie said, we want to share what this year has looked like. It's been a pretty average year, if I'm honest. Uh, For my health, it's not something you'd want to... I wouldn't want on anyone here. (laughs) But it's been a growth, it's been a journey of our growth in our yes to Jesus. And it's a hard place to say yes when you're in the thick of it, as you you probably have experienced and so it's through our journey, it's our prayer and that you'll be encouraged to fix your eyes on Jesus. Even when the circumstances are rubbish, when there is no explanation, in the seemingly unanswered prayers, when it doesn't line up with God's plan, God, I ask that question all the time, what's going on? that you would hold on to the hope that is Jesus. And so even now, I just want to pray for us that God would meet you where you're at right now. Holy Spirit, you would actually, like the surgeon opened up my heart, he would open up your heart and you would be vulnerable enough to let the true surgeon go to work. Five years ago, I discovered I was, it was a normal morning and I went, to, went off to work. I'm a plumber by trade. So I went off to the school that I do maintenance at and um, it's very normal. In fact, it was a day of uh, sort of personal training, first aid. I was in a first aid course of all things. <laughs> and I was sitting there watching the, the actual video was on the space where they, they're doing the heart attack and how to respond. And I had a bit of a, I was sitting down, I had a bit of a faint and I was like, oh, you're normally pretty good with, you know, squirmish things. I'm, you know, I'm good with blood and all that sort of thing. And so I fainted and sort of brushed it off as you do as a guy. And then everyone said, oh, gee, you look grey. I was like, oh, cheers. (laughs) And but given that we were in a first aid course, they said, we better better pop you over to the... um, There was a clinic over the road, so I went over there and they did an ECG. He worked the rest of the day and then went to the clinic. Yeah, Yeah, I did. You're impressed, aren't you? (laughs) Anyway, they did the ECG and then all the lights and sirens started. And I was like, I was actually quite happy. I was like, what's going on? And they took me into the the ambulance. Ruthie was there with the kids and was like, okay, because Ruthie being a nurse, I mean, you don't have to be a genius or a nurse to know that 
you're in struggle ten if the ambos are called. But um, yeah, discovered that I've got this genetic heart disease, and for whatever reason, it had decided to manifest at that time. Um, and over the course of a couple of weeks, discovered that my heart had dropped to 17% functioning capacity. And I think it was only sort of a few percent off before they start talking to heart transplant. Um, and so that's, that's what it was. At its worst, it was 17%. Thankfully, through medicine and prayer, later that came up to 45 50%. And so for, I think for the average human, it's around 60% possibly. 65, depending on if you're running marathons or not. <laughs> and so it's been, an, it has been an ongoing battle. It's been those five years of, um, you know, it's been, I've been fairly well. I've been able to live life, but it has impacted us. And it's, there's been stages of where it's popped its head up and I'm, you know, I'm not so well. And actually, I caught COVID at a leadership gathering. So thanks, guys. <laughs> In fact, I think 90% of us caught COVID. <laughs> anyway, unfortunately, that caused a bit of uh, build-up of fluid around my heart. And over the, the next two years, uh, this leak developed in my, in my tricuspid valve. And so early this year, I had to have open-heart surgery to fix that valve. And, you know, that's not news. That was, a, that was a tough news to hear. You know, even beforehand, always praying for healing. And then you get this news that you have, you're quite literally getting opened up. And, you know, apart from a cool scar, that's not an enjoyable experience. I have thought about getting a little guy to, tattooed who's welding. <laughs> this. That's the only thing I can come up with. <laughs> and even now as I stand before you, it's actually the new valve is leaking again. It's a moderate to severe leak. And so there's a very strong likelihood, other than I've received plenty of prayer for healing, which I'm believing for. But the likelihood is that I'm going to go through that whole thing ordeal again. And there's other parts of the heart that are deteriorating, which are pointing more to heart transplant. And so you're fa I'm faced with this predicament of, oh, God... <laughs> You know, we pray your kingdom come. Yeah, and so, you know, I'll just touch on it again, but just, you know, that all of a sudden becomes very real to live in the tension of the now and the not yet. So that's, the, that's a bit of context for you guys. And it goes without saying, but I, I mean, I think I've already been honest. <laughs> but I want to be really honest with, with my yes in that time. And it's been a mixed bag. I think you can you can probably relate that it, uh, for me it's been I've just been angry at God. I've been cynical. I've questioned Him. Even as I read the Bible and read through the healing stories, I'd be like, God, you oh another blind man healed. Hmm? How about no, not my heart. Cool. You know, it was, it was sarcasm. <laughs> and I've repented of that stuff. <laughs> but I've also had complete times of worship and submission to what God was doing. Even now, as I receive ministry time, I'm someone who visualises me with Jesus. And I was, I was crawling up to Jesus' feet. And he, he lifts me up, brings my head, like Dave said, lifts my head up to, to him. And I actually just crawled up on his back and he just kept walking with me. He said, you're going to be all right. It's not a promise of healing, but you're going to be all right because you're in me. You're on my back. I've got you. And so I want to encourage you, or what I want to encourage you with, 
as I've been walking this out, is the importance of a kingdom perspective, particularly through scripture and prayer. And these two things are key factors to our, for our yes to Jesus in the tough seasons. I mean, I say that, it's, it's probably two key factors for just being a disciple of Jesus, isn't it? But it's all the more apparent when you're, when you're walking through it. At the end of um, John's Gospel, or end of chapter 16 in John's Gospel, Jesus is having this chat with the disciples and again, I, I picture it as if he's talking, like John records it as if it's just bang, bang, bang. But Jesus, Jesus says, um, in this world you will have trouble. And I can't help but think that the disciples are actually like, hang on a second, hold that thought. What do you mean by we're going to have trouble? And the discussion plays out. But he, he follows it up. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And so he's not saying, again, it's, it's, we don't like to hear this, it's, at least I don't, but it's not a promise of plucking you out of the situation. Sometimes he does. It would easily be my leading prayer. Come and heal me now, Lord. But often he doesn't. But he does promise to walk with us, his arms wrapped around us, his Holy Spirit in and on us, guiding and advocating on our behalf. And really, reading scripture has helped shift my gaze um, to the kingdom, kingdom of God, who Jesus is, what he's done for me. And the verses that I in during this time, um, we can get them up on, I think I've got them on the slide. Hey? Coming out. Um, it's Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. So Paul has written this letter from, from jail. That's a good starting point, isn't it? He's, from, he's speaking from jail. He actually, you can read about it in Acts 16. He planted this church. He's, he's heavily invested in this church. And he's, these are his last encouragement, encouraging words to his people. I actually relate very closely to this letter. Or I, I felt like I related. When we've actually talked through this or preached through this at our church. And I've just, you know, for me to write a letter to my home church from hospital, not from prison, sort of, sort of prison, but it's <laughs> from hospital saying, I'm okay, God's been glorified in this. But Paul writes, he says, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all, the Lord is near, do not be anxious about anything but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guide your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And it's important to understand that context of where Paul writes from. And even as he planted this church, you might remember him and Silas were beaten. They were thrown in jail. Excuse me. Thrown in jail. You know, it was most uncomfortable with rods, I think the language is. And so that's, that's an important thing because for me anyway, I was like, initially when he says rejoice in the Lord, I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. How can I rejoice in the Lord? Don't be anxious about anything. I'm facing open heart surgery and because of the condition of my heart, there's a very real possibility of not waking up. Don't be anxious about anything. There's a few choice words there I'd like to say to him. <laughs> but what Paul is encouraging the Philippians here, and with what I want to encourage us with, is to bring our perspective into alignment with who Jesus is, the big story of the kingdom of God over our lives in every stage of life. And so, in doing that, I want to remind us, even now, our God, the Alpha and Omega, sent His only Son, Jesus, who revealed the Kingdom, 
through his life and ministry, goes to the cross for all of humanity's sins, is raised to life, conquering death itself, reconciling us back to the Father and leaving the Holy Spirit with us. All of which we have access to through, the faith, through faith in Jesus. And it's with that perspective that Paul actually writes, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Don't allow your circumstances to inform you of the character of God. Rejoice in the Lord, not because of your circumstances, but because of who God is. That is a tough thing to do. And it's not about ignoring the tough times. It's not a message of some triumphant, bulldozing God where everything's good. It's recognising the hardships while I anchor myself in Jesus. I was listening, quite naturally, whatever you're walking through, you tend to gravitate towards certain podcasts and N.T. Wright was doing some podcast, I can't remember actually where it was, but he says this, which I found really helpful. He says, our praise must include lament. Lament is to praise God that he is a God who has promised to make all things new. The lament is that we are still in this place of restoration the tension of the now and the not yet of God's kingdom. And it's just been a journey for, for me to be saying, yes, Jesus, to remind myself of God's goodness and his promise to make all things new while I live out this uncomfortable space of the now and the not yet. But those reminders of his goodness have come through his word. You know, that perspective and it's come through prayer, that relationship. Verse 6 in, uh, oh, you might not be able to get it up, but verse 6 in that um, Philippians chapter 4 there, Paul writes, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so again, with that, I want to encourage us to, to continue to keep praying. Who just said that? Someone just was as we were speaking. Keep praying. All the prayers, even the angry ones, the worshipful ones. Give it all to God. Have the honest conversations with Him. You know, God is sitting there, a Father in heaven, just like, oh, I'm so for you. But it's that honesty like that, God, where are you? What are you doing? Come, come now. Don't wait. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So, you know, that, that idea of um, actually just, I said down in Melbourne, it was like, it's like I was annoying God, like a, a mozzie, you know, just buzzing around as you're trying to get to sleep. <laughs> just winding him up with my prayers. <laughs> and again, but in, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray in, in Luke chapter 11, he uses that example, you might remember, where, you know, the friend goes to that other friend in, in there at midnight and says, have you got any bread? And then I just, I saw these words that Jesus used. He goes, yet because of your shameless audacity... The boldness and persistence to keep going to your father. I'm not seeing it yet, but I'm going to keep asking. It's not formula. It is just going to who we know is our provider. The beginning and the end. Fancy being able to call on our God. That's our God. Why would I... Why would I not ask again and again? Make known to God your requests. Again, there was another, I just, I'm an imagery man. 
But in, in hospital, I've, I've been praying this prayer and I've visualised this log cabin and I know God's in there. And I go up to it and I'm knocking on the door and the door doesn't open. And I'm, I'm screaming in there. It's like a desperate cry. I'm like, I'm running out of time. And then I climb up on the roof and I pull the roof off. <laughs> and I climb down in there. I'm like, where are you? Show yourself. And then I have that ministry time where I'm crawling to his feet and he lifts my head up and he goes, get on my back. It's all good. I've got you. But it's in that angry, like, where are you, God? That actually he meets with, he meets with you. He lifts your head and he says, I'm here. You're going to be okay. And it's through prayer we come into alignment with who the Father is, what he's doing in us, through us, to the glory of the God the Father. And, you know, prayer is answered in so many different ways. I haven't had the miraculous healing just yet. But I've never been closer to God in all my life. I experienced the peace of God, which goes beyond all understanding, which was incredible. Even as I went in before they fully put me out. I was just lying there just praying this prayer, praying these, the words of Paul. I'm going to rejoice in you, Lord. Let your peace guard my heart and my mind. And he met me. As a family, we, we pray each night for my heart. In fact, before school, the kids lay hands on my heart and speak healing. More recently in the holidays, it's before bed. It's just delightful. And plenty of you guys have been praying, and I thank you for that. And I want to press into the now. We do, we press into the now in faith. Making our requests known to God. But, you know, my hope is not in my healing, but in Jesus. The good news is, he's already won. I know the ending to this. Jesus wins. A few verses later, Paul writes, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So my prayer is that as disciples of Jesus, we continue to say, holy are you, God. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. In every season. I just, I just want to say thank you for letting us be vulnerable with you and for receiving that. That's a really unique thing. Uh, even just to be invited to speak in, we don't have an end point to this story. It's not like we went through that and now it's we're on the other side. So I actually, that's what I love about the vineyard. This is unique and I'm thankful that you're letting us share with you and, and I hope that that opens the door for us to share more vulnerably with each other and, and walk together even in greater measure. So thank you. Um, so Sam's just touched on giving our yes to Jesus in the tough times requires perspective and all kinds of prayers. Um, and I just want to lean into giving our yes to Jesus in the tough times forms our character and builds his kingdom. Um, I just want to read from Romans 5, a passage that I've kind of landed in over the last, well, this year since 
how, how many months are we into the year? I don't know, nine months. There we go. Um, and this is Paul writing uh, to the church in Rome, encouraging them to be unified, reminding them that salvation isn't in what they have done, like ticking all the boxes, I've, I've done the, the good Jewish thing, uh, but rather that their salvation is in their yes to King Jesus in his life, his death and in his resurrection. Um, and Paul is saying to them that that is what is needed to be the foundation in their kingdom community, their yes to Jesus. So he writes... Romans 5, 1 to 6. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, so not just that, not just that, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And thank you. I had a heap of people praying for me. I was a bit off in Holy Spirit moment land. I think Jonathan Ives, you, wherever you are, if you're here, spoke a very similar passage over me right then. So thank you for even just preparing me for this moment and being obedient. I think it was you, anyway. Um, you know, I read these, these, these passages, and many of you would, would know them. They're very familiar, suffering, perseverance, character, hope. But really, and you're getting a theme here of how the wrestle has been with us, I would love to chat to Paul. I, I have some questions. It's beautiful, sounds beautiful, but really, mate, Hold the phone in my life. Suffering does not always produce perseverance. Have you noticed that in yourself or in others? I know that to be true in my life. And when I use the word suffering or when we say sufferings, you can easily put in there tough times. Our current story is Sam's failing heart. We use this specific example, but think about it more broadly. You know the things that you've walked through. You know the things that you see others walk through. You know, we, we see this tough time, suffering. It's real, right? It's real. It could be so many things, grief and loss, trauma, acute or chronic health issues, relationship breakdown, loss of employment, a global pandemic. You can add to the list over and over and over again. It's walking through times of trouble, distress, oppression, pressure, affliction, hardship and struggle. This is the reality. You know, when the brown stuff hits the... <laughs> and then goes all over the room and affects every area of our lives, you know? That's the real deal. And if you want to hear more of that, I think I'm quoting him. That's his quote. And uh, just a shameless plug, by Maker, volume three, and you can read his story in that. <laughs> It'll be well worth your while. I just feel that suffering does not always produce perseverance. It might actually produce bitterness, cynicism, anger, resentment, a hardened heart. Stoicism, hatred, suffering might produce overworking, addictions. Those things that we use to numb, even the addictions that are not that bad, that we use to numb how we're really feeling. Maybe it's the need to always be in control. And hear my heart, like I'm really aware that this is complex. There are layers in this. It's a complex thing. But my story, our story in a simplified way really is I can recognise that in the more challenging times in my life, when I lean on my own understanding, suffering does not produce perseverance or character. When I try to walk it alone, what, in, what has been produced in me is often, and this is my story, a hardened heart. It's cynicism, like real, like real dirty cynicism. It's resentment and many other not pretty things that impacts me, it impacts our marriage, it impacts our family and it impacts our church. It's real. 
Now, I'm thankful that I, like you, am a work in progress, and I'm definitely learning, um, I'm on the journey of learning how to cling to Jesus in the struggle rather than thinking that it's a good idea to make myself Lord of my own life. But I think what Paul is saying here is this, that when we give our yes to Jesus in the tough times, what is produced is perseverance. Suffering produces perseverance. A yes to Jesus in the tough times develops and deepens in us the mindset that we will stay the course with Jesus no matter how battering the wind is or how crashing and damaging the waves are. And from this, perseverance refines our character. It's like gold being heated high temperatures to remove impurities, literally refined by the fire, it becomes more pure. As we give our yes to Jesus in the tough times, as we persevere through the tough stuff, standing firm with that perspective that King Jesus is our Lord and he is Lord of our lives, our character is being refined, being brought more and more into the likeness of Jesus. And the truth is this year, like Sam, actioning my yes has looked very, very messy. It's been a one foot in front of the other, walking in Jesus' direction. It's looked very much like a bleary-eyed, limping yes, a coming to Jesus saying, I don't know, but you do, yes. It's been, I don't want to go through this anymore, but I know that you are with me, yes. And I'm learning more and more that the way we give our yes to Jesus must be marked by the way Jesus gave his yes to the Father. Jesus showed us that he did not deny or ignore his pain or his grief, and neither should we. My yes in this season has looked less like a triumphant shout and more like a quiet prayer of surrender. And even as We've shared we're gearing up for some more challenge. We don't know what that's going to look like, but it's not looking all that pretty or great. I can testify still to the goodness of God pursuing me in this place. The nearness of God sustaining me, gracing me. Somebody talked about Corinthians last night. God gracing us. His grace is sufficient gracing me for the contexts and the responsibilities that I hold and multiplying the very little I feel like I have to offer in the spaces in which I serve. We've come to know that in these times when health are coming to the surface, that God is doing a work in us and in our kids. That really is irreplaceable. We see it in our children as we face this pain together as a family and bring it to Jesus. And there is a depth of faith being formed, may I say humbly, formed in us. It's happening. And it's not because we're doing anything particularly amazing. It's just this quiet, yes, Jesus. So I want to encourage you to keep giving your yes to Jesus, especially when things get tough. Because this is where often the the deepest formation happens. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance refines our character and character leads us back to hope everlasting. Ultimately, our yes to Jesus in the tough times leads us to live in light of the truth that he has overcome. He has conquered the world. And over the past five years, with the unpredictability and seriousness of Sam's health, the Lord has kindly helped me to realise that my hope cannot be in this world. Reality is, we want to grow old together. We want to be cute, grey couple, walking hand in hand. (laughs) We're both grey. I dye my hair. Just let's say. (laughs) But greyer... um, We want to be serving local church and traveling and doing all the things. We want that so much. So I want you to hear that. But the reality is, I know I I cannot put my hope in Sam's health. 
No matter how much I want that for our future, I cannot put my hope in Sam's health. And the truth is, we cannot put our hope in anything else but Jesus. We must build our hope on nothing else but Jesus. Our longing is is that Sam is healed. We want the kingdom to break in now. We want that. But the reality is, as vineyard people, as kingdom people, this now and the not yet thing is not just a pretty catchphrase that we put on, a, put on a sign because we think that it's nice and it sounds good. This is real. This is the real deal that we've said yes to. The now and the not yet of the kingdom. The tension is real. And in our yes to Jesus, Vineyard Church is Australia family, in our yes to Jesus, we must live as people who get this. While the struggle is real, I know that if Sam is not healed in this life, he will be in the next because Jesus has won. And I'm going to just briefly touch on the last point because I know that you're all hungry for lunch. But when we are marked with the hope of Jesus in the struggles, what we have noticed is a strange and wonderful thing happens. The kingdom advances. So our yes to Jesus in the tough times forms our character and builds his kingdom. Philippians 1 verse 12 says this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, this is Paul, what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a a result, it has become clear throughout this, the whole palace guard, he's in chains, and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of my brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul is in prison because of his proclamation of Jesus as Lord. And so the imprisonment's meant to stop that, right? But because of Paul's incredible kingdom perspective, he knows his king, he has hope, The gospel is being advanced through the chains. And I truly believe that like Paul, we are called to endure the tough times differently to those who don't know Jesus. Having hope in the tough times is the marker of being a follower of Jesus. And the the joy for us in what continues to be a very challenging, (laughs) challenging time for our family is the impact Jesus is having on those around us. It's been wonderful to see this in our church family, our leadership. David Thomas is here from our leadership, leading worship. He's on our board, our, our, our board and our core leadership team. It's been amazing to see what the Lord has done in them as they've given their yes to Jesus because of the impact what we're going through is having on them. Something's being formed in them on our wider church community. People who wouldn't maybe say boo usually are saying, interrupting, saying, we need to fast and pray, people. How can we do that? We need to pray properly. Something is being formed in our church. (laughs) Our neighbours. A year ago, our next door neighbour gave her life to Jesus. She came over. In her toughest days, the cops are outside her house, her former partner's there. Horrendous situation. What does she do when it all dies down? She comes over, knocks on our door, sits on our lounge in front of the fire and falls apart and says, you know what I need to do. Tell me what I need to do. (laughs) Puts it in our laps. And we can share the hope of Jesus and say, do you want that? She gives her life to Jesus. A couple of weeks later, she's baptised. She was at the last conference. You cannot stop this woman. She is on fire. You can hear her everywhere. It's amazing. She gets it. Her son, who's gone through some seriously tough times, just loves Sam. I'm watching the clock as I tell stories. Just loves Sam, right? And so he's journeyed this stuff with us. He hasn't had a father. And can see how Sam fathers our kids. Loves it. And so we just, every time we chat to him, we're like, he's like, how are you going? You know, we're like, it's only because of Jesus. 
We're okay because we have hope in Jesus. God is with us. You know, we just, we just share it because it's our real story. It's all we've got to cling to. <laughs> this year, things start going south again. And he, and I'm tr- really trying not to use the names as well, Debbie. <laughs> I'm about to do it. But he then, we're sharing with him, yep, this is happening. You know what he starts doing? He starts telling us. You're going to be okay because God is with you. (laughs) And a few months ago, he gave his heart to the Lord too. Like, I don't know how it happens, but it does. The footy club, last story, the footy club. And we could really go on and on and tell stories. But the footy club. Ben, our eldest, he lives for footy. He sleeps with his footy. He's brought his footy with him. He's sleeping with the footy in the hotel room. He loves it. It's his, it's, his, it's his whole thing. This year, he's got through everything with Jesus and footy. That's been his thing. And he has this incredible impact on the footy club by just being himself. He has a great work ethic. He trains hard. He's there early and he stays late. He's, in the, he's a younger kid playing in the older, older um, team. And he's just being himself, but he carries something that his teammates want. And so I watch, I watch them as he's training, and they all have to come and touch him. They all have to get around, like they just want to get around him, and he's just, he's, you know, cruising. But being at the footy club, and because of his impact, has meant we've been able to chat with some of the parents. Footy club, they're having a wine with some of the mums, my mum footy friends, who are just fantastic. I love them so much. Totally different scene, right, footy clubs? I love it. So we're having a wine together, splitting a bottle. And Sam's in, you know, we're just there telling the stories. There's, there's a lot of, there's four of us, five of us splitting a bottle. Don't, don't. don't. Yeah, that's the I realised that bottle. sounded quite bad. <laughs> there's a few of us. And they're saying to me, and you know, just a natural conversation, how are you still standing? How are you still standing? Because they're journeying it with us. And I'm able to say to them, it's only because of Jesus. It's honestly only because of Jesus that I can have hope. Like it's those simple moments where that's all I've got to say. I don't know actually how I'm still standing. I feel like I'm not standing actually. But it's only because of Jesus. Long story short, the mums have started coming to me and saying, oh, my kid's interested in faith and I'm not religion savvy. Could you have a chat? (laughs) Putting it in our laps. Another kid coming up to me I've known for ages saying, Ben's a good kid. Does he get in trouble? Oh, yeah, sometimes but not really. I want to be more like Ben. (laughs) Long story short, we've started a youth group in our house and we're running the Alpha course with four of Ben's footy mates who don't know Jesus, they don't come from Christian homes, and they are hungry for Jesus. There's three of our boys, so we've got seven boys on a Wednesday night in our house eating pizza, playing games, and chatting about Jesus. Our yes to Jesus in the tough times. Perspective. All kinds of prayers. It forms in us something that's irreplaceable and it builds his kingdom. Um, Maybe we'll leave it there, huh? Would you stand with us? Making me cry. Shut up. (laughs) 